How is it going, everybody? Here we are for another episode of Brush Hour. Uh, the show airs once every other Tuesday, and we talk about brushes in Photoshop and Fresco. And of course, as you know, this is certainly one of my favorite things to discuss, as I have uh, been very invested in creating brushes for years now. And uh, today I want to talk about dry media brushes, so pencils and pastels, charcoals, things like that. And we're going to look a little bit at the um, construction of these brushes, the sort of behind the scenes, like what makes them look the way they look. We're going to look at uh, the selection of brushes you have available to you. And um, we'll just take them one at a time in different categories. And uh, what we're going to do is start with uh, pencils. A good digital pencil is something that um, everybody wants. Everybody wants a really good pencil. And you know, there are a lot of them out there. And I tried very hard uh, over the years to make different kinds of uh, pencils that would suit different styles of drawing and uh, different uh, a different hand, so to speak. Everybody draws differently. Some have a heavier touch, a lighter touch. Some people want a little bit more texture, a little bit more grit. Some don't, some want something a little cleaner. And if you're looking for pencils, the place to go is really the uh, Mega Pack. Um, although the dry media set, uh, which you have available to you free through uh, Adobe, is also quite good. But we're going to look at the Mega Pack uh, for now. And remember, to get brushes, and I, I do this in every show, I want to make sure everybody's aware of how you get all of the brushes that you have available to you um, when you're a subscriber to Photoshop or Fresco. Um, because there are over 1,800 of them for you to enjoy, and that's a lot. Um, and the way you do it is you go over to your brushes panel. Here I've got my brushes panel open, and in the top right corner, there is a little drop-down menu. If I just scroll down here, you see the option to get more brushes, and that's what you want to do. You want to tap on that little um, option there, because what it'll do is it'll launch your browser, and it'll ask you to just sign in with your Adobe credentials, your username and password, and boom, you're going to have a massive pile of brushes to choose from there. They are organized into sets. Um, the very first set you'll see is called the Mega Pack. And another thing I like to repeat endlessly is that even though the Mega Pack is called the Mega Pack, that does not mean it includes all of the brushes. In fact, it is a standalone brush set. None of the brushes from all the other sets are included in the Mega Pack. Okay, so it's a common point of confusion. The Mega Pack has about 400 brushes in it. It's really massive. Um, but the other, uh, let's do my math here, 1400 plus brushes that you still have to explore and to play with are not in the Mega Pack. So make sure you grab all of those. All right, before I go on, I want to say hi to some folks in the chat, see who's joined us today for this. We have Wade and Sean. Hello, and Vikram. Nice to see you. Afroha, how's it going? Jason's here as well. Hello, Jason. Steven, nice to see you as well. Um, folks, if you're watching on Twitter or on uh, YouTube, I am watching the live chat here on Behance, which is be.net slash live. B e.net slash live. That is where you're going to find the chat that I am watching. Okay, so if you have questions about anything today, brushes or Photoshop or whatever, go ahead and uh, join over there so I can see your questions. Okay, so back to pencils. We're going to open the Mega Pack here and Inside of the drawing box is where you're going to find a lot of pencils to play with. Starting with the animator pencil. Now the animator pencil was a version, uh, this is the 2016 version of it. It's an improved version of the original animator pencil. Something that uh, came out in 2014 or 15, I believe. Um, and I think may have been the most popular brush I ever made. Um, tied perhaps with Gua Sha Go Go or uh, Mr. Natural, the inking brush. And what made this so popular um, was that you can, with the animator pencil here, I'm just going to draw a little bit with it. First of all, a lot of control, very nice touch as well. 
and you can go very, very lightly, very faint, and build up to a very dark value. So in other words, it behaves like a pencil, but there's more to it than that. The animator pencil takes advantage of stylus tilt. So what is that? Well, what this means is if I'm holding the stylus perpendicular to the drawing tablet surface, in other words, just switch my camera out here for a second so you can see this. Imagine this is my, my tablet, and if I'm holding my stylus more or less upright like this, I'm going to use more of the tip of the pencil, tip of the pencil, just like a real pencil. So I'm going to get fine lines, okay? However, if I, I'm going to show you this here, I'm going to get finer lines by holding the tip like this. If I tilt it, okay, at an angle and draw with it, I can get fatter lines and I can do shading like this. And that's what people want from a, a digital pencil. It's nice to be able to do both. Um, now there's another pencil I, I created that will allow you to do this and we'll look at it in a minute. It's called Tilterific. Um, but the animator pencil, um, in addition to being able to do this, has a nice built-in texture, a lot of control from light to dark, and that ability, which I just mentioned, to be able to draw fine lines, right? As well as get in there and do some shading. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at how this brush is built so we can understand what makes dry media brushes look like dry media. First and foremost, you have texture. Um, the texture really matters here. And so I've created, you know, dozens of paper textures uh, over the years. And for the animator pencil, I'm using a texture here. And you'll notice, this is important, that I've set the mode for the texture to height, height. Now, with Photoshop textures and um, how they interact with the brush stamp, one of the cool things that you can do is every texture is, a, is technically a grayscale uh, file that Photoshop is going to read. And with height, you are essentially telling the app that um, the darkest values, the darkest parts of the texture pattern file um, are going to be uh, recessed and the lightest parts are going to rise up. Uh, they're going to be higher up. So you're going to have a range in the gray scales all the way through white to black that are going to be higher or lower. Um, you have to imagine like a three-dimensional surface, like a piece of paper that has some tooth to it. Um, and uh, Or I might have gotten that wrong. It might be the opposite. The, the, the black, the darkest parts are actually um, maybe the, at the top, but now I've forgotten. Um, but in either case, it doesn't matter. What matters is that this means that you can control this uh, because you have a, a stylus that is pressure sensitive. And so you'll notice here at the bottom that I have a control set for this mode of height, and the control I'm using is pen tilt. Um, so what I'm saying is that the more I tilt my pencil away from vertical, the more of this paper texture I'm going to get to come through in the mark that I'm making. And that is why when, I, when I'm shading like this, okay, I'm gonna get a nice textural look you can see that coming through right there, all right? Um, but when I'm not, in addition to, of course, having the, the stylus in a vertical position here, create lines that are finer, I'm also gonna get less of that texture, but I'm still gonna get some of it coming through. And that I'm gonna, if I were to bring that down even further, you look at my stroke preview down here, you're gonna notice that then when I draw with it, more of that texture is gonna come through. So you have so much control. And for the dry media brushes, this really does matter. This is one of the keys to making it look like a pencil or a piece of pastel or, or whatever, right? Um, so I'm just gonna reset that for a moment. The other thing I wanna show you is jitter. So um, if we go to shape dynamics, you'll, know that, you'll notice I have a size jitter set here. 
And this is so that the line that I draw is not perfectly uh, smooth, okay? I want there to be just a little bit of jitter. Uh, so it's going to be a little, a little irregular on the edges. If I zoom in on this, it's a little hard to see because of all the pixels, but every line I draw is gonna have slightly lighter bits and darker bits and slightly bumpy along the edge because the size of the stamp is changing as I draw. And we'll talk about the lighter and darker in just a second. That has to do with transfer. But back to jitter, um, the other thing that's happening is there's a value of 30% scatter here. So I'm telling Photoshop that as I draw a line, I want the stamp that I'm using, the shape of that brush, to just bump up, bump down, bump left, and bump right of wherever my stylus is actually positioned by a value of 30% of the total size of that stamp. So because the stamp is very small, it's only seven pixels. Well, 30% of that is going to be, you know, almost imperceptible uh, jump, but it is there and that's just enough to create um, this look that we want, okay? And the other important thing is if we go to brush tip shape, right, you can do this. You can increase the spacing with your brush, okay? And by doing that, you give yourself, I'll just increase that even more, you'll see this, maybe something like 40, another opportunity and if I zoom in here, you should be able to see this. Well, it's a little harder to see. I'm gonna exaggerate this, but normally I would never do it this far. I'm going to go 100%. See how I'm spacing out the stamp here when I draw with it? If you increase the spacing with your stamp, you can also take advantage of these little changes uh, a bit more because they're gonna be more perceptible because the stamps are not um, piled up right on top of each other one pixel at a time. Instead, you're giving a little bit of space in between them. And that can be very useful. And I'll show you with the pastels, uh, some of them, they take advantage of that as well. Okay. All right, so another thing to note is that the darkness of the stroke, even if I use consistent pressure all the way through, is actually not going to be the same. And this is due to transfer having an opacity jitter. You can add jitter to opacity as well. And for pencils, it's extremely good. So I've got it set to 10 right now. If I were to bump that up to 100, okay, you'll notice a greater difference here. So you can see darker bits and lighter bits throughout that stroke, okay? So it's a little bit more sort of spotty. And that's done with the opacity jitter, okay? So that'll make a difference as well. So all these little things going into creating um, what winds up becoming a believable sort of pencil. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, of course, is the stamp shape. Of course, the stamp is vital. Um, without it, you wouldn't have anything to draw with. Uh, but, you know, with pencils, because they're so small, this one being only seven pixels, and if, even if I bump that up to 10, you know, you really can't see the stamp itself. Um, and so if I were to go and just select a completely different shape, for the stamp, such as this little guy here. And bring that down to about like eight or nine pixels. Um, you know, it's definitely gonna be a different mark, but it's still got that pencil look to it because of all the other stuff that we've done to it, right? So one of the ways you can create different pencils for yourself is to play with these settings, the scattering, the texture, transfer, the shape dynamics, and so on. Okay, and then you can go ahead and start changing up the stamp to see what kinds of marks you can make. So I could go to this guy, knock that back down to about seven pixels or so, and see what kind of a pencil that makes, right? And I like that one, that's pretty nice. It's a nice stamp for a pencil, right? That one looks pretty good. I'm digging that. I like the look of that one. Um, and so that would be some of the ways when I want to make new pencils, I'll sometimes play with the stamps and not do too much fiddling with these other uh, settings that I have. And that'll yield some pretty nice results. Okay. 
So when you're drawing with a pencil in a digital environment, um, I want you to always keep in mind, and this goes for any medium, that you want to draw in the same way that you would draw on paper with that tool. Um, and I think that when you have that mindset that I am using a pencil, you convince yourself that you're not holding a piece of plastic and drawing on a sheet of glass, um, it will impact the way you work with that medium. Um, and so if I were drawing with pencil, and let's say I was gonna draw like a, a simple sort of a head, you know, this is what I would be doing. I'm using light pressure, just kind of working out the shape that I want. So these longer strokes that I'm drawing like this, all this kind of stuff, this is this is how I would draw with the actual object, okay? And by drawing this way, you're also then gonna let the tool look like the real thing because the strokes that you're making, the direction you're moving the stylus, the amount of pressure that you're using, et cetera, this is all coming from um, how you would normally handle that medium, okay? So with a pencil, you don't want to do this. You don't want to be drawing around like really dark, super lines like that, unless that's how you typically draw with pencil. But most people kind of, with pencil, they sort of build up with it, right? Now, if you're doing your final uh, pencil lines over a a rough sketch, you know, you might be a little bit more deliberate with each line. And some people have really nice styles they've developed where they they do use a clean pencil line for something and then they, they use tone and patterns and things inside um, the, that line, etc. You know. So, but you can do that too. You can do that digitally, right? But just think about the behavior that you want from the medium and try and really emulate that behavior in a natural way uh, that reflects how you would work with it with the physical materials. Um, it could take some getting used to. It's easier, I will say, I think, for most people to do this if they have a draw on screen device. You know, I'm, I'm working on a Wacom uh, Cintiq tablet here right now, so. You know, I can see where I'm drawing and my hand is right there where the action's happening as opposed to if I were drawing on a tablet where my hand is uh, drawing in one location but I'm looking at a screen elsewhere to see the result, right? That can always be a little harder to, to get used to, so. Um, but that learning curve is actually shorter than you might think um, if you haven't tried it. Uh, you'd be surprised how quickly you can adapt. Uh, but this feels like how I would draw with pencil, right? And here's something else to note, which is that if I want to erase, okay, well, I want to use an eraser that feels like what I would use with the medium that I'm using as well, okay? And so I would jump over to the erasers in the Mega Pack, for example, and maybe grab like the kneaded eraser or the natural edge or even the basic eraser um, or this gradual eraser here. You know, something that is going to give me a result that feels like I'm using a rubber eraser or something I would normally use with, or a plastic eraser, something I would use with pencil. Um, yeah, you don't want to use just a standard flat round eraser when that isn't going to give you the result that you would get with the physical materials, right? So things to think about. Uh, all right, now, because I have this ability to shade, okay, I can come in here and I can just turn it sideways and I can just add a little bit of tone there along the side of the nose, inside the ocular cavity, under the nose, under that upper lip. Yeah, it feels very natural to do this. And that's what you want. You want you want the tools to feel like the real thing as much as possible. Um, and that's what I'm going for here. Okay? All right. So, there are different kinds of pencils here that you can play around with. Um, and that animator pencil is just one of them. But if you jump on down a ways, you have these HB Pencil Pro 
to draw with. They have a different feel, different texture. There's a mechanical pencil, which is really fine for nice, sharp um, lines if you're doing some kind of technical drawing, right? Or just need that beautiful, sharp pencil line. This will still give you a nice range of values too. Okay, so I recommend that for folks who are into that really clean line. If I wanted to come and emphasize the outline here of this face, I could use that mechanical pencil to do that. See? Um, could be good for people who do comics work as well. It could be a nice tool for you all. Um, there's a non-photo blue pencil and uh, um, there's there's currently a, a, a little glitch with my version of Photoshop where the color is not retained with the pencil, but typically um, there is a non-photo blue uh, color associated with that one that you can play with. Um, and then you come on down to the perfect pencil. So um, there's a pencil high res. That's for people who have to do like really big projects, um, high res projects where they need a pencil line. So if you were going to do something that was poster size, for example, and you wanted the line that you were drawing to look like pencil lines, you're going to print this like super large, um, then you would use this. So that's always a good thing to note and be aware of. Um, but here you get to the perfect pencils. These are, these are quite popular uh, because they're a little grittier. So for those of you who really like a bit more grit in the line, Perfect Pencil is your friend. I think you will enjoy that one. And uh, that'll do a good job for you. Let's see if we have any questions here. Yeah, non-photo blue is a classic. True. Ah, Bruce is here now. We got Stoney. What's up, folks? General Kenobi's here. Folks joining in. Um, Electra Mundo is here. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, so these Perfect Pencils really are a delight. Um, they're going to give you that nice gritty pencil line. And that's what some folks want. That's what people like, right? But not everybody. That's why we have options. Okay, but if I zoom in on that, you'll see really nice and gritty. That does the trick. I like it. 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 Okie dokie. Now, that's pretty much it except for Tilt Terrific. Now, there are some sketch pencils here that are really, really good for, um, for if you're going to do some kind of uh, outline work that has to have good, consistent, dark value to it, um, but that also requires some nice jitter, right? So this could be like the perfect kind of uh, drawing tool for those of you who have a style that really uh, works well with this and um, you should check it out. I haven't used these in a while, but uh, definitely use them for a few projects back in the day and very good for that. There are two of them there to play with for you, okay? Um, the soft fat pencil, yeah, that's what it is. Soft fat pencil. You know, what is there to say about that? That's just really fun. Um, and again, it's important to remember that all of these play nicely together. So for example, um, if I were to uh, go back to that perfect pencil, I'll just do this now, I'll do a little drawing. Um, and I just make a little sort of a head shape here. And give this person some some glasses. They're not even the same size. That's okay. Ah, what the heck. I'm not going to be too picky, but try and make them close to the same size.
All right. This is just going to be very cartoony. Little tiny ears. Um, so I got my nice line art here, okay? And that's what this pencil is going to do for me. It's going to get the lines in. All right, but now let's have some fun. Come over to that um, soft fat pencil, for example, right? And just add a bit of tone there in the hair, like that. That looks nice. Okay, add some tone in the glasses there, all right? Then we could do something like this. We can get the shady graphite, all right? So this is where we're gonna get fancy. We're talking about some other tools here. So we've moved beyond pencil now. We're still using the same medium, which is graphite, okay? But we're gonna use, we got this shady graphite here. We got the shady graphite fat dry. That's what this looks like, okay? You've got the shady graphite damp. So you got some nice damp graphite right there. That's fun to play with. You got Shady Graphite 2, right? Different tooth to it. I like that. Um, so yeah, I could I could then do stuff like this. Just start to add a bit of dirt and tone here on this on this face around this side maybe, like this. Just to kind of make it more more interesting. Um, got the basic Shady Graphite 2, which is well, it's kind of what you'd expect. You can size your brush up and down, right? You want more control. You can add sort of like even a sort of core shadow if you want to be weird about this and sort of render it, even though it's a cartoony drawing, you know? You could get, you could get kind of realistic with your rendering but you see how nicely those all play together nice how they play together and this is a great opportunity to just jump for a moment over to the topic of uh, smudging right and smudging is something you do with dry media so it's important to be able to use the right tools here to be able to smudge. And of course you can create your own smudge tools, but in the uh, drawing box, there actually happen to be a few nice smudgers in here. And the rough smudge scatter, okay, it's a good one for this. I like to sometimes just kind of do this. I'll just pass it over a few areas randomly in the drawing like this. And just make a little bit of a soft kind of smudgy mess here and there. Um, and then I can always come and I can clean it up a little bit if I want to erase away some bits. And I can draw back on top of areas that have been smudged. And you see what that does? It gives you that smudged area underneath the line art. Um, and so the more you kind of go back and forth with this technique, you know, smudge a little, draw a little on top of the smudge, erase a little bit the results you get is gonna look very, very natural. Um, see what I mean? You're really getting that nice effect of smudging, drawing on top, erasing, and all the things that you typically do with these tools uh, in the uh, physical, with the physical versions of these tools, the actual medium, yeah? So, uh, any questions about that? You know, like a good opportunity for smudging, I would think would be something like this, like make, give him a little tone on his cheeks or something and then just kind of smudge, smudge that area there. Make that all soft and smudgy like that. Yeah. 
works for me. So now you're getting somewhere. Now you're taking the tools and actually making a drawing with them and you're using them in a natural way. Um, those of you who work with, with pencil or charcoal are probably familiar with this, but another thing people do often is they'll pick out areas with their eraser, which is another reason why you want to use an eraser that feels um, like the kind of eraser you'd use for that kind of technique. And so, you know, if I were going to want to pick out some bits and pieces here, I'd want to make sure that the eraser I'm using has a nice natural feel to it. Um, I can't remember which one I have right now. I think it's the gradual, but like the natural edge would probably be closest to what I would use. Size it down a little bit. If I wanted to pick out highlights in the hair across the top, you know, this would be the eraser to do it because as you can see, it's not taking away any any of the, the graphite um, in like such a clean, perfect way. It's allowing me to just lift, lift some of it out. You know what I mean? I can lift some of it um, and then draw back over the top of some of that. And again, I can smudge some of that together. Just keep on going, just keep doing this over and over and over again and playing around um, until you get what you want. So I like that shady graphite damp too. I didn't use that much, but that's a nice one. Just add a bit of tone. We had that soft um, fat pencil. That's what we were using earlier as well, right? I'm gonna go too dark there. By the way, don't forget you can control the flow. Bring that down to like 10%. It's not gonna be quite as dark, right? All kinds of stuff you can do. So any questions about what I've just done there? Um, Matthew, you're gonna talk about building your own brushes. Yes, I did that at the beginning of the show. Did you, if you've joined late, you can watch the replay. I talked about like the settings for these, the pencils, for example, like what makes them look like pencils um, and so on. So you can you can watch that back. Um, but if you have another question related to that, and I'm not I'm misinterpreting your question, just let me know, and we can talk about it. Um, let's see. Not enough time to try out all these cool brushes. Uh, well, you know, take twenty minutes a day. You'll be done in a month. <laughs> Uh, Kyle, could you explain if the Wacom shouldn't be inclined, not using any kind of stand in order for the pen tilt? Um, totally up to the individual. Uh, it should be, you should be sitting in a natural, comfortable position so that you don't cause yourself any repetitive stress injuries or cause your posture to be, you know, bad, hunched over, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I tend to have it like a drafting table. I have it tilted up the way I normally would and I'm sitting at a comfortable distance and I can tilt easily and all that makes it easy for me. I wanna make it as little work as possible on my body. Um, but to, to each their own, you have to, you have to do what, what feels uh, natural for you, right? So everybody's different. I can't really speak to, to that without, um, it, it's gonna be very uh, opinionated kind of, thing is it's up to the individual it's it's totally different for everybody all right so that covers graphite and um we talked about the different kinds of pencils we talked about using these different graphite tools in combination with one another i want to quickly move on to charcoal here there are a few oh wait there's also i'm sorry the, the wet crayon is also a nice one to play with if you haven't ever tried that but you can do some pretty nifty stuff with that one. Pretty nifty. You'll notice that with every with every stroke you make, um, there are these little sort of wet, smudgy areas that show up outside of where you're coloring and drawing. Um, and that really can create some pretty interesting effects. Uh, so I recommend you check that out. Certainly one of the more unique brushes I ever made and uh, uh, I do like it. Okay. 
And since it is, you know, wet crayon, you know, try, try it with other colors and layer it like this. See how nice that is? You get this layering effect of color on top of color. You really start to blur the lines between digital and uh, traditional work here when you, when you work this way. Um, and if you uh, throw in some smudging there as well, you know, so I'm blending a little bit here with smudging and then just blur that a bit and draw back on top. You, you really have a hard time distinguishing this from traditional work, which is fun. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's move on to charcoal. There is one tool here in the Mega Pack called Wet Charcoal, which is similar to the wet crayon we just looked at. Um, but I want to start with the typical dry charcoal you'd expect, and that would be the charcoal pencils. We have these, um, there's charcoal burn, which is great for just adding a, a smudgy bit of charcoal. Uh, smudgy is the wrong word, but just a, a nice bit of charcoal onto your page and then working with it. You know, you want to add some tone and it's got that, that heavy texture in it. Um, this could be useful for you, uh, especially, you know, if you want to lift out, lift out areas with the eraser. You could either, you could even draw in reverse if you wanted to, you know, like cover an area. And this will respond to tilt as well. So, you know, more tilt you use, more texture comes through. But, um, you know, if I wanted to tone an area and then erase away something from it, I could do that. Something like that. You could also use the brush um, in clear mode by holding down the tilde key if you're in a, a more recent version of Photoshop. Okay, but if you're not, you can come up here to mode, clear, and that'll make any brush you're using into an eraser, right? So that's a handy thing to remember. Sort of a additive subtractive process here. You know? All right, now, charcoal pencils. There's a there are a bunch of these. We have these charcoal champs, okay? Uh, and I believe there are five of those. Yes, there are five. Um, I usually use number two. Uh, it's just the one I use the most for charcoal pencil drawing. Um, and again, if you look at how this brush is built, like we did with the pencils, you'll see, of course, the stamp, which, you know, in this instance, it's a little bit more important because the stamp is going to be more visible given the fact that our spacing is set to 9%. And we do have a lot more... Um, uh, size jitter, the angle jitter, if you notice, is set to 100%. So that stamp is just rotating all over the place, every single instance of it, right? Which is what's giving it that irregular border, okay? And that sort of wonky look when you draw with it. So it's not totally um, predictable in the least, in fact. Uh, and that's good. That's what you want for, for that kind of thing. Um, you know, you want, you want that line to be unpredictable and but still you have control right I still have control you can get really fine nice sharp lines with it okay but they just have that natural quality to them and variations of all of, of these so you get number three uh, number four etc uh, you'll notice that four is a lot more subtle okay so if you're looking for a lot of control you want to get in there and do your detail work with charcoal uh, go ahead and use number four that's gonna do you right there. And number five, it's got its own thing going on. Dark and charcoal-y. Okay, so those are available too. Um, China marker, anybody who's ever used China marker knows what that is. Uh, if you draw with those in your life drawing classes um, or you just buy them in an art supply store and want to see what they're up to. They're more waxy kind of a uh, pencil that makes a very nice dark line. And the line breaks apart, as you can see here, in and out. Um, and that's just a natural quality of that kind of a brush. Conte Crayon is also here. Uh, so for those of you look, looking to do a little light drawing, uh, life drawing, pardon me, why not do a little sepia Conte Crayon drawing? Okay. 
Don't forget to smudge that as well and then draw on top of it. Very natural. Um, but uh, speaking of the charcoal, I want to point out that you now have an entire set of vine charcoal available to you um, in Photoshop and Fresco. They're built into um, Fresco and they're available as well for Photoshop. Remember coming up here to that uh, get more brushes option, you will find them there. Um, and inside there you have some brand new charcoal pencils, okay? And uh, these are a little larger than the others, so you can, you can go quite large with them, but also have that nice ability to add tone if you want. Um, they also respond to pen tilt for the direction of the, of the charcoal as well as uh, for how much texture they're going to add. All right, so I recommend you play with those and see how they are. Uh, but this, what's really nice here is these is these vine charcoal uh, tools. So for life drawing and for just um, roughing in a drawing, I think you're going to enjoy these. Uh, I use them a lot for my demos, for my um, my portraiture class with my students, and uh, yeah, I just found that they're they're just like butter, um, especially this number one and number two. These two uh, very buttery, soft. Uh, Closest I've come to getting that nice vine charcoal feel in a digital environment. Um, really nice. See that? And you can, you can quickly add tone as well. And these are meant for for good high res stuff. So if you got to do some high res stuff, snag these and play with them. Um, you can always size them down if you want for smaller work, of course. Uh, but they are designed for big stuff. That's why their their stamp size is you know larger. I mean, this is a 70 pixel here, but you can actually size it up. The original stamp size was something more in the vicinity of I think 200 pixels or thereabouts. So you can really go large with these and get no pixelization. Uh, whatsoever, which is which is great. We like that. We like things not to be pixelated. Okay. Alrighty. So, Cody says Conte Crayon is the only brush I use. My fave. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Thank you, Cody. Um, trying to do some very specific stuff. Haven't found anyone who has done quite what I'm looking for. Matthew Hall. I'm not sure what it is you're looking for. Looking for. Um, more the actual build of them from scratch. Oh, Matthew, I did a whole show on making brushes. In fact, I've done multiple shows on making brushes from scratch. If you go back and look at the Adobe Max session I did two years ago, um, just type Adobe Max, Kyle Webster, Photoshop brushes, something like that you'll see how it's done, okay? I've also done other classes on, on building brushes from scratch, not to worry, there's plenty on YouTube. Clarissa says, if I'm in brush settings and set my settings, how do I find the brush in brushes? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Ginger, you love these brushes. Great, thank you. No, Sean, I don't have all my brushes loaded, but uh, I have a fair number of them. Um, okay, so there you go. That's that's charcoal for you. These are all different, you know, give them all a try and see how they behave for you. They're all quite different from one another. Um, so plenty of stuff you can do with those. All right, let's uh, take a look at pastel now because that's such a lovely category. Um, and I'm gonna go back into that mega pack to do this because there are a couple things I wanna show you here. Not, not just, um, not just, uh, Good old regular old dry pastel, which of course is a blast. But also um, we have oil pastels I wanna show you. So, but we'll start with pastels. So we have the new pastel. That was the probably the first one I made way back in the day. And new pastel is very dry. I mean, you really gotta work to build up some tone with it. Um, it'll take you some time. So if you're looking for something that just is gonna add a little texture even to a drawing, you can use new pastel for that, not even use it for drawing, but just use it to add a little bit of grit, a little texture, a little shading, 
Um, and a lot of artists do that. I've seen this. A lot of artists will make a shape um, and they'll fill it with solid color. Okay, so as a demo here, I'll see people do this all the time. They'll grab that new pastel and they'll just throw a little color on top like that. And that just makes it more interesting. Uh, very, very common technique. So if you've seen that look out and about, you know how they're doing it. Good old new pastel or something similar. You may make, make a solid shape um, and fill it, grab a slightly darker color and go ahead and you could even do like this, you know, they'll, they'll like sort of shade it so it's darker and then it kind of just eases out. That's what's happening, okay? Easy peasy. All right, but let's talk about Pastel Palooza. Um, this was one that uh, that took off and was was, was fun for folks. Um, why? Well, because you know you're going to get the nice pastel look to it, and it's a very predictable brush. Um, you you know everything you do with it, you can you can pretty much guarantee that it's going to do what you want. It's not so the edges and things and the, the jitter are not so irregular that you can't control it. But one of the things I want to say that I love about working with Digital Pastel is that I like carving with it. So in other words, if I, if I, if I have a shape that needs to say sit on a, on a solid background and it needs to be really clear. So let me do this. So let's say I have this this blue kind of a background color, okay? And then I have this this shape that I need to be really clear. Okay, well, what I like about working with pastels is doing this kind of thing, like going back to that background color and just sort of carving out around it, okay? And then I'll take this color again and just sort of dirty up the edges a little bit like this. Okay, like a little bit of that powder from the from the pastel just kind of made its way outside of the borders. But that to me is a fun way to work. Um, so it's that, you know, come in here, clean that up, clean that up, you know? So just constantly doing this back and forth kind of a thing to get exactly what I want. And with the pressure, you know, and repeated strokes in one direction or another, I'm able to do that. I'm able to get exactly what I want uh, to get the edge quality that I want, okay? So lighter pressure, you're gonna get more of that texture coming through. Very basic, very basic, um, but that's all you need, right? You don't need things to be too sophisticated to get a good result. Um, Sometimes I'll do this, I'll sample whatever color gets mixed on top of everything. You know, if I wind up with a color that's a little lighter, when I'm using lighter pressure, then I can get softer transitions like this, you know. And of course, you always have that good friend of yours, the smudge tool, you can smudge. The, ways, the reason I'm able to do this really quickly, by the way, folks, this smudging all of a sudden, like I just start doing it, is I have a key command of S set to call up my smudge tool. You can do that yourselves. You can set a custom key command if you're constantly using smudge in your workflow. Go to edit, keyboard shortcuts, and when you're in there, you go to your tools. Okay, and you slide on down to that smudge tool. Blah, 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 blah. There it is, see smudge? And I have an S right there. So that's how I do that. Um, okay, Pastella. This is my favorite pastel tool. One of the things that makes Pastella unique is um, one second. Maybe it's this one. Yeah, Pastella Tilt. This is the one I'm looking for. Sorry about that. Uh, Pastella is fine. Pastella is good. Don't worry. I'm not slamming on Pastella, but I want to point out that Pastella Tilt. Um, has a, a just a tiny bit of color dynamics built in, just tiny. 
and maybe difficult for you to see that but I tell you it makes a huge difference when you're drawing with it it's just going to be a little bit more natural um, color dynamics meaning that the hue the saturation and the brightness are, are changing with every instance of the stamp just slightly just a little bit okay and it's also good for blending you know getting a lighter color coloring on top sampling that color just kind of going from one to the other this is a really handy thing and I, I use this pastel tool probably more than any other this is the pastella tilt um, I really like it it just gives me a, a, a look that uh, feels like what I'm after every time Um, another thing to try with pastels, I want you all to just keep this in the back of your minds, is to tone your paper, so to speak. So let me show you this technique. I learned this from Gary Kelly. He's an absolute genius with pastels. Uh, but he did this cool thing where he would take most of the colors that he was going to work with in an illustration, and he would just, so if, like this is the area that I'm going to work with, he would just take those colors so let's say that he had a, a range of colors he was working with um, like a blue a brighter he would just kind of put them all on the page in random places like this just kind of color them over each other color them over each other like this okay and get one of those warms in there You know, um, you smudge it all together, I know this is taking a little while to show you what I mean, but just bear with me here for a second. You kind of smudge it all together like this, um, and then just like mix it all a bit more and you get this kind of a neutrally kind of ground um, for his drawing and then he would draw on top of that and what would happen is like all this color would just sort of be sitting there in the background it would show through whatever he was drawing so then if I would actually go ahead and use some some colors up over the top of this to do a drawing right Just as a quick demo here. You probably hear that funny sound of my Cintiq, uh, of my, uh, sorry, my, my stylus on the glass because I'm using a soft nib. So it, it, it always makes that sound. <laughs> I apologize for that. It probably sounds weird. So you see how what comes through is just sort of helps to unify everything. I'm not sure how to explain this, but it's so cool. I watched him do this and I was just really taken by by it uh, as, as a process of, of, of just kind of making your colors kind of kind of work. Um, really liked it. Pretty nifty. And you know these these traditional media techniques people use um, they should make their way into your digital art because they're proven techniques they've been around forever and they really do some neat stuff and since you have the tools to be able to recreate very easily uh, these techniques you know why not try them and so like here if I then want to go and, and do this lighter sky color back here right just by using light pressure I'm putting that color in there but with that ground showing through, right, it just kind of makes everything else read in a harmonious sort of way. Does that make sense? Am I making sense or is this all just mumbo jumbo to you all? See this? It's such a cool thing. Um, and I watched him do this on a, he did a pastel 
portrait of um, Frida Kahlo and it was so gorgeous at the end uh, and I think it just it, everything just sort of held together with that ground poking through you know and even if you, you cover up most of it you know you're gonna cover it up but it just does something to the picture so anyway check that out all right, so that's pastel. Now, quickly, oil pastel. Got about one second to show you this, but I want to make sure you know it's there. Here you go, oil pastel. Now, why is oil pastel special? Well, I'll show you why. Check this out. Grab another color. That's why, folks. You can blend. You can blend right on the surface with them. And so, you absolutely must try those out, okay? There you go. Well, but, you know, hours go really fast when we're playing with brushes. Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you in two weeks for another one. Tomorrow is the draw along show at uh, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Hope you'll join me for that. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. See you soon.